about the compassion in Christ tonight. And we'll just look at a variety of verses and a variety of things that demonstrate his compassion and then show us that we as followers of Jesus Christ need to be a compassionate people. Now, if you really want to know a person, you've got to understand each and every part of that individual. And Jesus, of course, being the Son of God who became a human being, like human beings, he is, uh, has very many different facets about him, different characteristics that we can look at, and compassion is one of those that we really need to look at, really need to understand to, to, to know him on a personal level, to, to begin to understand what he stood for, what his purpose was, and the very fact that he was willing to give it himself, it all revolves around that being a compassionate person. But this is the one part, that, that the one characteristic that really lets us look into the heart of Jesus, where we need to be, and uh, to understand and to try to emulate that great heart, that great love that he had. And uh, we cannot read the New Testament scriptures without coming to the conclusion that Jesus was a very compassionate person. And a few events really point that out. And uh, first of all, just understand Jesus was compassionate uh, from the uh, physical viewpoint. And Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to go there and read. If you want to go and just kind of look at it, I'm going to give you, uh, relate that passage to you. It's the feeding of the 4,000. Of course, we know in the scriptures we got two miraculous feedings. One was 5,000, one was 4,000. This is the second one. We'll look a little bit at the 5,000 uh, in just a moment. But at the feeding of the 4,000, the, the setting up of it is something that's very important. Jesus had been teaching and preaching. His disciples, especially the 12 in particular, had been working very hard at, at what we might call a, a getting the people out into uh, an area and, and speaking to them. Uh, sometimes we have uh, different congregations, different groups within the, the church will uh, go out to a park somewhere, or go out uh, to a, just a place where they can get together, be apart from nature and such. And be teaching and preaching and uh, you know have a, a nice weekend to get away from all the pressures, all the stress of the world about them. And, and it, it was one of those occasions that, and they're just working so hard, even at this getaway, that as the people leave, Jesus gets his twelve and say, "Come on, we we've got to go even further. We've got to get away." We've got to rest. We've got to just sit back and talk about things. So they depart, and the people see them leaving and follow them. And that leads to this feeding of the 4,000. But the passage in there where Jesus, as he sees these people, and he sees them as sheep without a shepherd, he has compassion on them. Even though he is so tired, he can barely go. His apostles are so, are so tired, they can barely keep going. They meet the needs of the people. They heal. Jesus heals people. He teaches people. They're talking with people. And that leads to this continuation, past time when they could really go and find food. And it leads to the feeding of the 4,000. Seven loaves and a few small fish feed about 4,000 people. But it stems from the compassion of Jesus because he said, no, no, I just can't do this right now. But we need to have this rest period. He, he put the needs of those people above him. We see that also in the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. And once again, he looks upon the people and he has compassion on them. Because here they are. They've been out there with him for so long, they haven't brought enough food. His disciples are coming to him. What are we going to do? They're going to faint. We've got to get them out of here. He says, feed them. 
teach them, teaches a very valuable lesson to his apostles of what can be done with very little if you start with that compassion that, that's necessary uh, for people. Now, now some uh, of the translations call it pity. They'll say Jesus had pity on the people, but the pity concedes a need. We, we can pity people. Well, we can look at someone and say, oh, that poor person. But compassion meets the need of the individual. Compassion reaches out to do something to alleviate the need that the individual has. And that's the type of, of compassion Jesus had and expects of us. And sometimes it's, a, it's the unknown factor that comes into play. In Luke chapter 7, Verses 11 through 15, Jesus is entering into the village of Maine. And as he's entering into the village, he's passing, uh, there's passing a funeral procession. It's the funeral of a man. He wasn't very old, but his mother was a widow. And this was her only son. And he passes this, this funeral procession. And, and the mother, the widow, comes by and she's crying and she's weeping. And Jesus has compassion. He doesn't say to her, you want me to raise him from the dead? If you have faith, I can do this. He stopped and he touched and he brought that son back to life because of the compassion he had for that woman who had lost her only son. She didn't ask for a gift, but she got it based on the compassion of Jesus. And, and, and we receive that compassion also. You know, that, that there was a time I didn't know I was lost. You can probably say that for yourself. You, you didn't know you were lost, but uh, somebody got to you. Somebody preached a sermon or somebody sat down and talked with you about God's Word, about the need to, to have a righteous life. And you come away understanding it. I'm lost. I, I've sinned. And then the compassion of Jesus is shown because Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did that out of compassion. Out of compassion, He went to the cross. Out of compassion, He rose from the dead. Out of compassion, He will raise us from the dead so that we can live with Him eternal. The church, uh, the compassion shown by Jesus in the physical area uh, pales in comparison to the, the compassion that he's shown in the uh, spiritual affairs of human beings. Mark chapter 6 verses 31 through 34 but well again that's, that's going back to the feeding of the 5,000 there. And again, he puts aside his own need of, for rest to be able to tend to the spiritual needs of others. Now, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39 in particular, that whole chapter, uh, it's, it's a woe chapter. And Jesus is pronouncing woes upon the people of Jerusalem and of Judea because uh, they haven't responded to his teaching and his preaching as they should. Now, uh, uh, one greater than Solomon has appeared, and they don't really care about it. They're fighting with him. They're nitpicking things with him. They're, they're, the Pharisees are trying to kill him. But he sees the city given over. And, and not responding. So down through there, woes and woes and woes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and to the scribes and the, the lawyers and all. And he gets down to that end part, though, about verse 39, and look what he says. He can just feel the compassion and that's in his heart as he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who have killed the prophets, slain those who were sent to you, how I would have gathered you to me as a hen, a mother hen, gathers her chicks to her, but you would not. 
He's just pronounced all these woes on you. You're going to be destroyed. It's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be better for all these cities. But yet, the compassion is there. And he's probably almost crying about this because they're going to be lost. Jerusalem, in about 40 years, is going to be destroyed along with the temple once again. What is it? The, the, the spiritual inadequacies of the people, it, it, it hurts him, it bothers him, but yet there's compassion there. And that compassion is what moves him to do the things that he's doing. That compassion is what's going to move him to go to the cross. What hurt Jesus, I think, more than anything else as he dealt with man is demonstrated in John chapter 11, especially verses 32 through 37, that period where he's dealing with Mary and Martha. Lazarus has died, and he's come, and he's late, and they're getting on him. They're on his case. If you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. Martha says it, Mary says it, and Jesus wept. Right? Verse 35 shortest verse in the Bible, in the English Bible, Jesus wept. Yes, He knew He could have saved him if He had been there. But something greater was going to happen. What was hurting Jesus was the lack of faith that Martha and Mary had, and the lack of faith that, that the people who had gathered around to mourn. When Jesus says, roll away the stone. No, He's Thinks by now. Oh, what are you going to do? Oh, you, you, you should have been here. And he called Lazarus forth out of compassion. Compassion for Martha and Mary. Compassion for the people who were so weak in faith, they needed to see something like that. Well, wouldn't that be impressive if you saw something like that? But still, how many of them disregarded it? They sought all the more to kill him. But yet there was that compassion, that love that he had for Lazarus, Martha, Mary, and, and, and the love he had born out of his friendship for Lazarus. Well, the church of the New Testament exhibited compassion, this compassion like Christ did. Uh, they demonstrated it in the things that they would do. And again, the, the first century church, when, when we go back and we read the book of Acts and then uh, read throughout the letters, we find that they were very compassionate, that they were taking care of one another, taking care of the physical needs of one another. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, going down through there. Uh, and, and, and many... People today confuse it with communism or socialism and say, well, see, the, the church was communistic because they were all together and, and they held all things in common. No, it wasn't communistic. It wasn't a state government telling them this is what you have to do out of compassion. They were gathered together like one big family and they would meet one another's needs. They would see that one another was fed. They would try to help one another uh, if someone was ill. They had compassion one upon another. And one of the great testimonies of the church was see how they loved one another. Compassion drawing them to to take care of the needs of one another. And it didn't stop there just in Jerusalem. See, as they went out, as they took the gospel out into the world, they would teach that example to others to the point where in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, the Apostle Paul talks about the famine that was down in Judea and Jerusalem at the time. And he talks about those churches that wanted to help and would send money down. That, that was up at Antioch and Samaria and places like that. Later on, 
See, one of his journeys back to Jerusalem is to take funds from the Gentile churches, from, from uh, Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth and Ephesus and all, and yeah, the, the Galatian churches, all of them. Why? Because they've learned this great lesson from Christ and from their forerunners in the church to be a compassionate people. The compassion of the first century church was shown to meet spiritual needs also. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Terrible time for the church. The persecution is going on in the church. Uh, Saul of Tarsus had basically stirred up a group of people. He was in on it. And they stoned Stephen. And they persecuted the church very heavily at that time. And, and it says there that those who were scattered went everywhere <coughs> preaching the word. They didn't use that as an excuse not to teach others. But as they went off to these other places, they were compassionate to those who might even become their enemies, who might even be the next ones to try to kill them persecute them, destroy their families, try to destroy their faith. They taught the gospel wherever they went. They were compassionate to the lost, even to the Samaritans. We get that picture given when Jesus tells the disciples and the apostles what they needed to do. You know, Terry here in Jerusalem, you're going to spread the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. One of the first places to receive the gospel outside of Judea was Samaria. A people that the Jews hated. And typically they hated the Jews also. So they back and forth. But they took that gospel there. Now, now listen, it had been set up though, hadn't it? It had been set up. Jesus set it up in John chapter 4, didn't he? Because he went through Samaria. He stopped there and preached at Jacob's well to that woman who was a woman of the city of Samaria come out to draw water. We know the story. She goes back in. She tells everybody, hey, this must be the Messiah. He's told me everything about myself. They come out, they listen to Jesus, He preaches, He teaches, the seed is sown, but see, when the church is spread, it's one of the first places they go. And the church grows in Samaria because of the compassion that Christ had way back then, and then the compassion of the church when the persecution comes to take the gospel there. The early church was compassionate for the lost Gentiles also. Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches to the first Gentile convert. Now there are a lot of people that didn't understand it, a lot of people that didn't like it. But it was God's will. But it was a matter of compassion in doing that. To see someone who's lost, whose soul is in danger, to preach the gospel to them, to teach to them, that's compassion. That's born of love. Now, now, to go around telling people they're going to go to hell just because you want to make yourself feel good, that's not compassion. But to really go out and to talk with people and, and, and to try to help them see the light of the gospel is truly compassionate in a spiritual way. Ephesians chapter 2 Verses 11 through 18. We'll look at the first few parts of this. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what they call the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were, who once were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
brought near by compassion. The compassion of someone like the Apostle Paul, who once, as Saul of Tarsus, tried to kill Christians, tried to destroy the church, now he's out preaching it, and he's going to places, he's going to those new places, taking the gospel out there. Because of his love for God, yes, but because of the compassion he has for the lost. Another compassion shown by the early church was its adherence to the truth. You say, oh, wait a minute. I have an adherence to the truth, the compassion. Well, because the love for God that is there, when you want to uh, know the truth and obey the truth and serve the truth, it's something that comes from the heart. And there's the connection that's there. But that when we see what Jesus has done for us, we truly want to do something for Him. But what this means is that we will demonstrate compassion in both the physical and spiritual areas. Truth. That when we walk in truth, we walk in the truth in a physical way of service to our God, we walk in the truth in a spiritual service to our God. In Romans chapter 12, see, verse 1. Uh, be not conformed to, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies in living sacrifice. Physical only? No. Spiritual only? No. Both of them. Physical and spiritual. Bringing it together. Saints, Jesus, say, the, the Son of God, Spirit, came down and became a human being. Flesh putting the two together. And then the compassion flowed. And that's the way it is when we are uh, realize that we not only are physical and have tasks, obligations to do as the children of God, but we are spiritual beings also. And we have a great message to teach others, to help them to see that they are spiritual beings, that they have souls that are going to be lost if they don't hear the gospel, if they don't uh, respond in a proper way to the gospel. When false teachers tried to combine elements of Judaism with Christianity, the church of Jerusalem took action. They got together, they heard what was going on, uh, Acts chapter 15. They sent a message out to all the churches. We, didn't, we don't want it this way. This is not the way that God wants it. There are certain things we ask you not to do, like don't eat things strangled or anything with blood in it. Stay away from fornication. You know, staying away from fornication is a great thing. The other two, you know, for that time period, I don't even know that the other two really count today. But, you know, I, I'm going to try to get all the blood out. Like my wife says, she wants a hamburger. She wants to move out of it. Okay? That's okay. I don't know if it's so much a spiritual thing today, but for the Jews, say, for the Jews to become Christians, that, that, that could be a pretty bad sticking point because life, they knew, life is in the blood. So, uh, but they saw the need not to put up barriers between themselves as ethnic Jewish Christians and the ethnic Gentile Christians. Uh, don't build barriers. You know, in, in the church, sometimes we build too many barriers. We need to tear <coughs> some barriers down and get to know one another and, and, and uh, have compassion one for another. And when we do that, we, we actually become stronger. Now, we can't miraculously feed multitudes today. We can help feed the hungry. Uh, we have to have compassion on people. We can't raise the dead, but we can have pity and compassion and do the right thing for the fatherless and the widows. Right? James chapter 1, verse 27. That's what pure religion and undefiled before God is, to visit those people in their, it says affliction, what does that mean? In their womb. And if we're compassionate people, we will be doing that. But we demonstrate compassion for the truth by then opposing every false doctrine. So you have both sides of it, the spiritual and the physical. To be a Christian, 
is to be Christ-like. If we're not Christ-like, then we're not Christian. To be Christ-like, we need to be compassionate because Jesus was compassionate. Paul tells us, challenges us really, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me even as I imitate Christ. Paul says, just don't imitate me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's who we imitate. That's who we emulate is Jesus Christ because he set the perfect pattern for us. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. We want to inherit a blessing from God. We want to inherit the blessing of eternal life. We've got to be a blessing. We've got to be a blessing to one another as brothers in Christ. We've got to be a blessing, a, a blessing to those in need, which means we need to be compassionate. Paul, or Peter says, you were called to this. To be called to follow Christ was and is to develop within us individually, both physically and spiritually. And collectively as the church to develop within us the characters, uh, characteristics of Jesus Christ or the character of Jesus Christ, each and every one of them. It's a good place to start is with compassion, isn't it? Be compassionate like Jesus was compassionate to us. How could the body not be compassionate when the head is so filled with compassion. Thank you for your time. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight, happy. we ask that you come take a seat here in the front as we stand and sing the invitation song.